See the positioning there behind the column so he can't hit six. All right. Oh, the stun! What? Huxall! Oh, no, it was Incredible. during the animation as Ding. well. Got all that close. And there it is. Diem goes down. Violet finds Azai. The most important pick is Super. Brings the hammer down. And that will bring the curtain down. The San Francisco Shock complete the golden stage. Hello, 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 and welcome to Esports M30 this fine Tuesday evening. I'm your co-host, Ron Renantha Ali, and with me is my host, AJ Fry. And it's Tuesday, which means uh, some Overwatch. Was that, is that okay? I've been, I've been asking to do this for two weeks, and I, I, I think that was not bad. Yeah, yeah, it was, was pretty good. It's about as good as I am at Overwatch. Yeah, which yeah. is awful. So you're saying, you're saying that was not good at all. <laughs> no. Can we do it again? Can we, like, I need no. a second. You're fine, Just you're fine. One? That's a keeper, yeah. I'm never going to get to do this again. Cut it, print it. It's wonderful. <laughs> all righty, Ron. Uh, the fifth week of the second stage is all locked in. The playoff picture is clear. We've got so much to talk about. We've got an amazing guest coming up as well. But I say we start things off traditionally with some highlights. as you like. Oh! Oh, that's a huge one! Set of four down! So now Trinelle's a double okay. kick back there with the extra damage. Super swing in Luffy in the corner. Oh. Can't do anything about it. How have you come back from this? They can just go ahead and chuck these guys off the bridge into the drink. Rally's in. There's the stun. Oh! Yeah, sure enough. Ben, <laughs> what are you going to do now, buddy? What are you doing now, buddy? See you on real! You just punch the Reinhardt. That's what you do. Oh, you just out a Ruckus. What is this? I thought he was only just a great Widowmaker. Gesture trying to make these plays. He gets Spike as well. The two. He kills Soba. The three for Gesture. Nobody expects the Gesture Doomfist. Nako going lower and lower. Then just going over into the back. Grabs coming out simultaneously on either side. Pokemon trying to stay alive. The barrier going to get broken. Jonak finds another kill. Bomb out into the back. Nako. He finds a triple kill against the odds. Shuts them down. They maintain control. So they sort of just play it up front with this barrier. Oh, happy. Oh, boy. See the positioning, they're by the column, so he can't hit six. All right, oh, the stun! What? Huxall! Oh, no, it was incredible. during the animation as well. He couldn't take action and recall even if he wanted to, because he was knocked into the air. The burst damage was good, and you had to fire man EMP on the Los Angeles Gladiators, but the numbers aren't favoring Boston. RCK doesn't seem to care, though. He is now boosting. He had to do some work. Hydration goes down. Another one for RCK, and he's looking to try and carry this one on his back. Translocates back to the point, and now the cavalry has arrived. Fusions is back on the point here. The wrecking ball is for having an impact. Blase getting rid of Raw here. A very long draw now. Five, but it looks like the Boston Uprise is able to weather the storm. Decay goes down. That is a disaster. Oh, Mono looking for the flank shatter. Oh, he comes in. He finds both supports. They shut them down. Fantastic flank play coming out from Mono. Poco tries to drop the hammer. He might not get a chance to use it. Snatcher's ready. There it is. And they were not ready. The transcendence comes in. Boombox at least keeping the team alive. But now they got to make it back over to the cart. Boombox wins his attack in. But the rest of his team is dead at the spawn doors. Ding. Not all that close. And there it is. Diem goes down. Violet finds Azai. The most important pick is Super. Brings the hammer down. And that will bring the curtain down. Desperately trying to sprint across the map. And he has to reveal himself to contest the payload. And he does so just for a brief moment. But no one else is there. It's over. The San Francisco Shock completes the golden stage. Jay Hog with the trans. Mason runs away. He doesn't want to give him any stats. Don't give him any stats. Gushue <laughs> was after him too. Chucks the grab out, gets it off. Both grabs in play. The trans is on both sides as well, keeping everybody up and healthy. But we did get a D-Mac on Michelle. Michelle's working on getting that back back though. A little too high there. He's got the shatter. He got Marvel around the corner. No finish, but Munchkin out of position. Still Mark on the verge. Still lost Fitz as well. Falling apart here for this whole dynasty at the very end. It's looking like the Spark will succeed. Will find victory. 3-1. And they secure the final spot in the playoffs next week. Yeah, it came down to the final few games where records were set, playoff spots were secured. It was an amazing week of Overwatch action. And to offer some insight, we've got a former pro and current coach. Welcome to the show, Vitas Mineral Lasitis. Welcome, my friend. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, long time no see. <laughs> yeah, long time no see, Ron. All right. All right. You're so, friends with everyone, Ron. Yes, we I get am. It. You're you know, popular. You're I cool. Am. Yes, okay. keep it no, keep it coming. Uh, we got to talk shock. Uh, we do. First, Golden Stage, 4-0. Uh, in their most recent match, just incredibly impressive. So the question is, are they the team to beat, or is it still the Titans? 
Uh, honestly, I do think Shock is the team to beat. Uh, I think uh, in stage one, in the finals, Vancouver was actually quite a bit better. I think even though it was a 4-3, I think Vancouver won its maps a little more decisively, whereas Shock kind of clutched out the maps that they won. Mm. Um, whereas now, when I look at the two teams play, it really feels like Shock took that loss personally. And, you know, like you, you don't go into a stage and win every single map and make that kind of a point of emphasis if you're not really hungry and i think shock have come into the stage super hungry they look very very clean in their execution whereas i think vancouver is kind of still riding that high a little bit and i do feel like i mean it's difficult to say before they actually fight head to head but it does seem like shock is leveled up and uh i i'd probably expect them to take it this stage oh wow that's very interesting so shock all the way you're gonna ride the wave uh, yeah, I'll, I'll ride the wave. <laughs> wow. I mean, like, like on that note, do you think any other team is going to ever have a perfect stage again, or do you think this is like a one that's like one off thing? Uh, honestly, it's possible. Uh, maybe not this. It, it's it's definitely possible if we only have seven game uh, stages. But who knows how the structure is going to look next season? Mm. Obviously, we have two season two stages left. Um, you know, this time around, but if the stage length is increased for season three, then I think it's going to be difficult. I think it's very, very difficult. And even Shock kind of got away and really clutched out um, a couple of rounds maybe that they shouldn't have uh, won. So it really is, it's, it's really a testament to their mentality, you know, the fact that they they work so hard to achieve that. And I think it's super, super impressive. Uh, perhaps we'll see it in the future, but I think it's going to be a tough one to crack. Well, another team finally getting things together, looking like the team that everyone predicted before the season got started. Uh, Hangzhou Spark uh, took out Seoul. It was 3-1, mm -hmm. to one, so mm -hmm. it was a pretty rough, well, not a rough game, but like it was an interesting game. <laughs> rough dynamic. for one of the teams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts uh, on Spark moving forward? Uh, are they finally the team that we were expecting them to be? Yeah, honestly, I've been very impressed with Hangzhou, especially this last week. I think going into week two, week three, uh, looking at their games back then, I, I felt like their uh, Winston Goats was at a really high level, I think even on par with some of the better teams in the league. But I felt like anytime they would go into a Ryan Mirror, they'd really suffer and they wouldn't look as strong. And I, I felt like it stemmed from the fact that obviously Gushe and uh, the rest of the team don't speak the same native language. So, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of those Ryan duels come down to like your bubble timings, how you read how you read into distance and things like that like very very small things and i felt like they couldn't really ride gushway's winston mechanics as hard when they were playing those compositions but honestly and again so they looked really really clean i felt like gushway outplayed marvel in that in that matchup they were getting the best out of all the trades so i was really impressed by the way hangzo looked uh, i still think they're a little inconsistent uh I, I still think going up against some of the very best teams the vancouver's the shocks they still suffer a little mechanically because those teams are just so so strong in every position but i do feel like hangzo's kind of uh, broken into that top tier echelon definitely into a top uh, top 10. So you say they've broken into the top tier and now they're going up against London. Do you think now they're back to form to how people were kind of saying, oh, this is, you know, possibly one of the teams to beat preseason based off of scrims and, uh, you know, can they beat London in the playoff match? Uh, I would maybe pump the brakes a little bit on that. I do feel like they've improved and they've gradually grown into it. I think they've really shaken off the nerves and I know that for a team that's never been on the Overwatch League stage, it might take a stage to actually shake off those nerves. Uh, certainly play, uh, we suffered with, you know, through similar struggles with the Mayhem last year, I think from stage one to stage two. And I do th see them really coming into form now, but I think, uh, you know, I'd, I'd pump the brakes. I think London is also another team that's looking really, really strong. Uh, they're, again, coming into their own. They're showing us what they're capable of. I think that's another team that should have probably had a perfect stage that slipped up a little bit at the finish line. But I do feel like when they turn it on, you, you can't really bet against London in a playoff series. And, you know, if, if anyone's going to upset the top dogs, I feel like it could be uh, London. So I, I do feel like they should be able to take care of uh, Shock. Wow. Well, let's talk about another potential upset. Or, that you've spark, already... Sorry, Spark. Yeah, yeah we, we got you. Um, <laughs> Shanghai, they've managed to upset their their tradition of losses. They've gone from one of the worst teams in the league to now uh, squeaking into the stage two playoffs. Do you think, now you've already said San Francisco Shocker, your, your prediction for winning this stage two playoff. If Shanghai were to pull it off, uh, upset the Shock in this uh, first bracket, what would they have to do? What's the game plan that they would have to take into this match in order to do it? 
Well, I think the thing that Shanghai has going for them is the fact that they play an unconventional style. They don't play into a goat's mirror. They try to uh, try to abuse Ding's Pharah as much as possible. They try to utilize, uh, you know, their three DPS versatility, putting Young Jin on the Doomfist. Sometimes they also try to play a lot of Sombra Goats, which uh, inevitably, you know, gives you a little bit of a chance against uh, Shog because if you try and beat them in a Goat's Mirror, then you're probably just going to lose because they're too good. Right, right. Uh, so, so I guess that X factor um, is is looming um, over over the series. But I really think that Shock show that they can deal with Shanghai's Shanghai's style mm -hmm. uh, in the 4-0 victory here in the end. Even though Shanghai definitely had a chance to win a map here or there, mm -hmm. uh, but I think also it felt like Shock felt the pressure. Oh, guys, we need to get the perfect stage. Uh, that maybe made them a little. Uh, sloppy in their execution occasionally, and I do feel like they they should be able to take take care of Shanghai in the playoffs as well. Even though Shanghai probably hasn't a chance to take a map here or there. So kind of on that topic, because they've kind of run into each other so many times before, uh, because you've worked for the Overwatch League, obviously, um, how does playing a, a team again so close to after playing them, um, you know, like the week prior, affect your preparation? Well. Obviously, when you'll when you'll have one week of preparation, you can't really reinvent your style or add too many strategies. That is gonna kind of I mean, there's not a lot of ways to cheese your opponents, I guess, unless you have something in your back pocket that you just haven't pulled out until the playoffs, which I don't think like too many teams have. Some teams might have that, uh, so I think it's difficult to really for Shanghai to do anything else. I think they're probably just gonna roll with what's been working for them, which is trying to get funky with these. Uh, uh, three D three support variations by throwing in a, a DPS, whether it's Samra, whether it's Farah, mm -hmm. uh, playing this weird, slow, funky style that kind of uh, it, it it changes the way you have to play if you're shocked. So I, I think they're probably going to stick to their guns. I don't really see them uh, pulling something out that's out of the ordinary. But obviously their style is sort of out of the ordinary. They are the only one uh, that is sort of playing that that type of style. So um, yeah. Well, let's focus on some winners who most recently became losers, uh, ending their winning streaks, uh, both the NYXL and the Gladiators, uh, NY losing to Atlanta and then the Gladiators losing to Boston, but they're both secure in the playoffs. They're going head-to-head. Yeah. -head. So looking at these two teams in this matchup, what should fans be looking for in the, in this battle? Oh, sorry, you said Nixel and which team? And Gladiators. Gladiators, right, right. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting matchup because, yeah, like you said, both teams showed some slip-ups. Obviously, New York losing two in a row to Atlanta, that's yeah. very weird. Um, it does feel like maybe there's uh, something mentally there for New York Excelsior here because it doesn't feel like they should be losing to a team like Atlanta. No. Um, and they've also, obviously, they boomed out of the playoffs against Seoul uh, <laughs> last stage. So, you know, we it's kind of a reputation that starts following them, and I guess when when you've had a lot of um, bad results in the playoffs, it's it's easy for that to affect you mentally and go into that and even, even sort of in the back of your mind. And I think Gladiators, you know, they did look a little bit rough against Boston. Again, I, I think if they replay that match, I think Gladiators should win that more often than not. But there was there were a lot of sloppy plays, uh, I think, on both ends. Uh, Gladiators looked a little bit out of sorts. Um, but they have looked very clean this stage, with the exception of dropping maths here and there. So. I do feel like the Gladiators can do it. I think Gladiators also, um, I think they play a very similar GOAT style to New York in terms of how they use their bubbles, how they shift tempo and stuff like that. But I feel like Gladiators are a little more aggressive, they're a little more proactive, and they can also bring out these weird pocket strats with, um, you know, triple, su triple support um, on Hanamura and things like that, or, or, or rather 3 DPS on, uh, on Hanamura and then transitioning into these weird compositions on second points and you go, you know, why, why do we even play into this? Um, so I think, yeah, I think Gladiators have a, a little bit of an edge in that matchup, I think, uh, which might might be a little controversial and a, and a hot take, but yeah, <laughs> I, that's, that's the feeling that I have going into this matchup. Well, I mean, I kind of like that you say that Gladiators maybe has a little bit of an edge. If you were to work for the NYXL, if you were coaching them, and you know they have this history of maybe choking a little bit, um, what sort of kind of tactics or strategies would you take to make sure your team is mentally prepared for this battle with Gladiators? Yeah, honestly, it's uh, it's difficult to say without like being in the room and measuring the pulse of the team. Maybe, maybe they are <laughs> sort of mentally strong and they just shrug it off to you know, well, we d maybe didn't take them seriously enough or or whatever. It's it's, it's hard to measure the pulse because when when you're in there in that room, you can probably tell like there's usually one or two players who maybe feel the pressure and they act out of character and they make you know uncharacteristic mistakes and sort of drag their team teams down. Maybe it's through being very panicking comms or whatever. So obviously I'll, I tried to identify that, see if, you know, 
we have kind of a culprit in the uh, in the server who is uh, pulling the team down a little bit and try and work with them, make sure that uh, you know they kind of go in and play you know with with calm nerves, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we got more questions uh, for your coaching style coming up in just a bit, but I want to focus more on the league. Uh, we had an interesting thing happen here at the conclusion of this uh, second stage going into the playoffs. Aside from your top three teams, it's completely different teams that we're seeing in the playoffs right. here. So of those teams that are not in the playoffs but were in the stage one playoffs, are there any that you see as being deserving of a spot as we look to stage three and stage four like mm. is it just this you know strength of schedule what are the teams that people should maybe keep their eye on for eventually regaining their position in the league writ large uh you mean out of the teams that dropped out of the playoffs yeah for this that, stage? that we're not yeah. seeing this stage hmm well <coughs> Toronto. Honestly, I, <laughs> Toronto. <laughs> honestly no I, I think Toronto ah. was one of the teams that was lucky to get into the playoffs the first time around I think um you know I, I was looking at the schedule and I think they beat I think they beat one other playoff team on their way to securing stage one playoffs yeah. so I do think stage playoffs has so much to do with their schedule you know so missing out now I think they had an extremely tough schedule um, I think if you look at stage one there were a lot of teams that snuck in through just having very easy schedules I think Atlanta also kind of uh, were the beneficiaries of that whereas some of the other teams who maybe were deserving like Gladiator sort of picking up steam towards the end of the stage they had a very tough stage so mm. uh, I, I think play, uh, stage playoffs I don't really take them too seriously because yeah, I think schedule dictates, especially like sort of five through eight. I think it really those positions are really dictated by schedule a lot. And I think, you know, like if, if we look at the table, really, um, last at least last stage, the difference between I think like the sixth seed and the sixteenth seed is just map differential. You know, so uh, yeah, I, I don't really pay attention too much uh, to that. But I, obviously, out of the teams that missed out this stage, I'd say Soul Dynasty are a favorite to get back into it, uh, next stage. I think uh, Philly Fusion is definitely one other team that had a tough schedule that could be back mm -hmm. in contention uh, next stage. I think those those two are the favorites, and also I think Boston Uprising is another one, especially since they also had a tough uh, schedule this this stage, and it's going to get a little bit easier uh, in stage three and stage. For. Wow, so I mean you talked about a lot of teams there and I'm going off script a little bit here Sorry, AJ, but I do have an interesting question. I really want to get to mineral which is um, you know You talk a little bit about strength of schedule and like how maybe the playoffs aren't indicative of the best teams moving forward um, You know a lot of people like to do things like power ranking So if you were to create one kind of on the spot um, Do you think you know your power ranking is accurate to the way maybe the the Casters power rankings look or do you have a much different idea of what teams you think are good or bad? No, I think most of the power rankings that people do on a weekly basis, uh, usually there's not too much difference in those by now because we do have a relatively big sample size. You can compare and contrast from week to week and move teams up and down. You don't have to necessarily overreact uh, on a win or a loss. Like you maybe you move down a spot or move up a spot on a win, but you don't like plummet in your rankings unless uh, you just get super if you're a top team and it gets upset by a lower like a very low tier team right. uh, so I do, I do think like most of the most of the team uh, people who are doing these power rankings in the community I think they kind of got they, most of them look similar I think most people agree on these uh, tiers of teams with Vancouver and shock obviously being ahead of the pack by uh, quite a decent margin mm -hmm. so yeah I think I think everyone's kind of um, everyone's kind of on top of it well, okay. you, you teed up Vancouver and Shock as uh, top of the pack. Is there any chance that any of the teams uh, on the other side of the bracket from the Shock might actually overthrow the Titans before our final match here? Oh. Well, it's difficult to gauge how the bracket is going to come out because obviously they reseed for semis. So depending on who wins each matchup, you don't really know how the matchups are going to end up. Uh, and I think that has a lot to, to do with it. It's difficult to predict. Obviously, so upset New York Excelsior last stage and their reward was to play against the Vancouver Titans, you know, so <laughs> yeah. because they were the eighth seed. So they automatically pay, pay against the first seed or, or something like that, you know, so um, Honestly, I don't think so. I think London is the, potentially the only team that could really step in there and upset these teams. Obviously, I think Gladiators and New York Excelsior have, have a slight chance as well. Uh, but I do think that over a best of uh, seven or, you know, yeah, because when you get into semis, it's going to be best of seven, I, I believe. Mm. I think over a best of seven, those, those two teams should still come out on top, even though I, I feel like it could, it could be a lot closer because Shock and uh, Vancouver, we have to remember, swept their way to the finals um, last stage, and I think it's going to be a little closer this year, uh, this stage. Yeah, I mean, 
I, I think that's all incredibly good insight. But moving forward, I think the, the, the elephant in the room is talking about kind of like your relationship with Florida, obviously having worked with them. Um, I mean, like obviously Florida Mayhem has had quite a turbulent run throughout this stage, despite some quite large changes. Yeah. Um, do you think like they need to make any, any sort of additional changes to see some improvement from them, given that they had a 0-7 stage? Well, looking at Florida, obviously they're in a rebuilding stage right now and uh, the rebuilding is in process because the decision to kind of reset and go full Korean was made relatively late right before stage two. There's really not enough time to uh, recruit new players, you know, recruit a new coaching staff, all, all that stuff. I think it's there's just not enough time between between stages unless it's uh, during the mid-season break, which we're coming up on now. So I think... Uh, I know from what I hear behind the scenes, not only regarding Florida, but a lot of these teams uh, that are looking to make moves that are looking, whether it's to g gain an edge to kind of work their way into the playoff race or whether it's just climb out of the bottom. I think everyone is going to take this break to really make moves and see if they can uh, uh, put their teams in better positions uh, to win. And I think Florida, just beca because of how late the decision was made, they just didn't really have time to uh, carry out that vision and it was obviously a work in progress at this stage and uh, we're probably going to see a Florida that's uh, you know bounce back at least um, a little bit in in stage three well it seems like maybe this next question is ridiculous for the fact that it will never happen but I've been posing it to a lot of our guests including paintbrush who is of course uh, from the mayhem mm -hmm. Academy team mm -hmm. uh, with their team doing so well uh, the idea knocked around in my brain, like, can't you just flip your teams, bring up your contenders who are on a roll and throw them right onto the main stage? Is that an idea that you would ever see happening in OWL, or is that just so far-fetched that I'm an idiot? <laughs> well, I think, first of all, it's just logis logistically impossible, pretty much, because you already have so many players under guaranteed contracts on your roster, so... Right you have to pay out those contracts and what you're going to sign the entirety of your contenders team to Al Con like is, is just such a huge expense. Uh, but beyond that, beyond the logistical aspect, I just don't really think it uh, makes sense either. You know, it's, it's how sort of a meme that people like to ride, but I think there's still a, a decent gap between contenders and um, um, Overwatch yeah, League. Yeah. And, and if you think that any sort of contenders team in NA can step up and you know, maybe they can be better than sort of the the bottom tier, but to even think that they'd climb into top 15, I think is silly, uh, okay. especially without, you know, having a lot of time to, to practice against uh, top competition. Well, thank you for saying silly and not idiotic. I appreciate it. <laughs> Someone has to be nice to you on this couch, and it's not me. Exactly. Oh, but it's, it's, it's obviously fun for the fans, you know, to, to talk about this. But, you know, I, I know how, how it usually looks when Al teams play uh, or scrim against contenders teams. And even when you're a bottom Al tier team, it's not like the difference between your, the top contenders teams and bottom Al tier teams is massive, you know. And if the difference isn't massive, then why would you ever make such a drastic change, you know. You'd, we'd yeah. much rather look to put together bits and pieces uh, and build something for the future, something that you can, you know, you feel uh, has more, more potential mm -hmm. in the long run. So, you know, ending on that note of the future, right, now that your kind of tenure with Florida has ended, can you, is there any sort of like kind of big lessons you can take away from that that you might want to um, apply in the future or anything like that moving forward? Oh, absolutely. I mean, honestly, I haven't, there's no period in my life where I've grown as much both as a person and as a coach uh, than I have during these one and a half years with Florida, you know, like just being under, obviously there were a lot of things that, you know, maybe I wasn't too happy about towards the end. There were a lot of struggles that we had to go through. Uh, but honestly, it put me in positions where I've never been before. It made me uncomfortable in a lot of positions and it made me grow. You know, I think uh, that type of adversity just um, helps you grow. And I, I honestly, those are the biggest lessons that I take away from it. The fact that I've learned how to handle adversity, the fact that I've, uh, uh, you know, under like I've dealt with so much, so much of it that I, I come out sort of on the other end uh, I wouldn't say immune, but I, I can handle all of it much easier. And I think mm -hmm. it, you, you learn so much more from going through everything that I went through than like kind of riding a positive wave and uh, winning with a team. You know, I think it's right. just uh, it's just a huge life experience. Yeah. Well, great to hear that you get that takeaway. Yeah. Mineral, thank you so much. Uh, excellent insight. If you want more from Mineral, you can check out his YouTube page. Wish you the best of luck moving forward and hopefully we'll have you on the show again. Awesome. Thank you, guys.
No, he was excellent. And Ron, we still got a few minutes to talk some Overwatch big picture items. Uh, where do we start? We want to talk about workshop stuff first. Yeah, let's go workshop because I spent the last four hours yesterday on that, just kind of like tinkering around. Now, what games were you playing on Overwatch Workshop? I found an amazing aim trainer uh, created by uh, Twitter user PMA Jellies. Okay. Uh, who, um, you know, I like to practice my aim and training. And yeah. then do a few quick plays before I hop into a ranked game. Right. But now I'm gonna add this whole uh, thing he, they created to my regime. I'm gonna just uh, sit down and then. Different for each character then? It's there's different modes, so you can adjust what you think is best practice okay. per character. Right. So I spent a lot of time doing it on Ash because uh, that's the default character. They like yeah. set it to you have infinite ammo and just oh, go from target to target I need to target. My Ash aim improved so yes. much. I mean she's not super popular now, but it's no. good to come in handy in the future. Yeah. I did a lot of McCree, mm -hmm. you know, um, working on those like flicks. So it's just it's just really good practice overall. I spent like maybe an hour or two on that. Does it work the same way? Like is the game called Osu where it's like the tracking? Well, that things, yeah, or? I mean, but because that's so rhythmic and like they you have it set to a pace it's right. not the same as if you're frantically going from target to target to target yeah and, overwatch like, isn't overwatch. the same as that like constant, no definitely like not. i play a ton of osu i love that game but yeah. it teaches you a different type of precision right okay. um on top of that i also that the same user created a mode where you can practice throwing like set on a grenades or arista shields or zarya uh. grabs works with the kind of like uh, they, they programmed it so you, you can see where things are going in, in sort of arcs. So you can plan to do like crazy over the wall nades, hitting right. people as they leave spawn and stuff. Um, this is something you see in CSGO all the time, yeah. but we don't really see in Overwatch. Well, uh, this is fantastic. This is great. Dying for this kind of thing, like yeah. the training material beyond just Someone the of your caliber will need it. You know? Thank you Someone for that. Just not as good Ron. as me. Someone not as good as me will need it. Well, let me just scroll past all the Ron <laughs> Burns on the script to find what our next talking point is. Uh, we got the uh, Overwatch Finals. Uh, this isn't confirmed yet. Might as well. But it seems be. likely that they will be held in Philadelphia. Yeah. Which will be uh, fun. I don't have strong feelings about this one way or another. No. Because um, it's not in my hometown. But it's yeah. nice that you know it gets you know. East Coast Philly. love. It'll yeah. be Eastern time zone, so we won't have to stay up too late or. No, that's nice. Get up too yeah. early if it also, was somewhere like, else. Philly's probably not going to be there. Kind of sucks for them. <laughs> I mean, I'm just going to say it now. I think it's highly unlikely to see Philadelphia we won't Fusion. We've seen them in the final finals, but maybe they'll make the. Playoffs. Yeah, maybe they can make a guest appearance, but they're not the they're not the they'll big. Be a show. wild card team. You think so? No. No. No, I mean, I don't, I, nice I'd be right surprised now. if they would make it even that far, actually. Yeah. I think there's just so many teams that are on the rise right now that are really, really good that it's yeah. pretty unlikely to see them anywhere near top four. But that's just me. I could be wrong, but that's that's how I feel. Uh, let's talk about uh, the All-Star game, which is also coming up after this uh, second fun. stage playoffs. Fun being the most important word here. Not yeah. competitive, but fun. Fun. Now, why will it be so fun compared to the stage Playoffs. What's the difference? Here? Because we don't got tanks. We, we're just we're just playing DPS all the time. <laughs> They've announced some. But come like, on, with like big stars like Bumper and Super. They're like, not in. They're not. No, we mm -hmm. got we got DPS players galore. Guys that might not have even played like Pine from NYXL, who's like a uh, you know second string, hasn't played much for the New York uh, team this yeah. stage at all. He was voted in. And a okay. bunch of dudes from Chengdu who are, you know, we wouldn't. Well, Chengdu are the most fun to watch. Exactly. So it would make sense that you would see a lot of their team represented in the. Yeah. All stars, but yeah, that's bizarre but, uh, but to me. When you think of when, like the all, -star all stars, players. yeah, you think of all stars, you think of like the best, right? Yeah. But these guys are, I, I think you'd be very hard pressed to say definitively, uh, you know, backing with any sort of good concrete evidence that they're the best. They're fun to watch, um, but it just seems weird to me. Like even Pine on social media, after seeing the results come out, he's like, "Oh, I'm a part of this. What? Like, I, <laughs> I haven't even played." Yeah. So. You know, it's again, it's more just it's it's a popularity contest more than anything. Is it just based on like who's got the the sweetest highlights from various weeks? Then, no, or a completely is it just community like based. Social, okay. Completely, com yeah. So a bunch of people probably still have like, um, you know, fond memories, a lot of nostalgia pumping in for Pine's amazing widow back in right. season one, and obviously a bunch of Chengdu players made it in because they're fun to watch now. But also yeah. like China has a massive population that can skew the vote. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm not saying they don't deserve it. I love the Chengdu guys. Yeah. But to say that they're, you know, All Stars does definitely does not represent the best players. Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe we'll eventually get like a best players All Star. Yeah, game an MVP as well. night or something. Something as yeah. well. But that is all the time we got for you today. Big thank yous to Mineral for calling in. Ron, as always, for insulting me mercilessly, hurting my feelings you in a deep it. way that makes me cry myself to sleep at night. Thank you for watching. Tomorrow, same time, same place, we got Brody and Drew talking all things Smash and uh, fighting games. Until then, exclamation point socials in the chat. See you in the future.